And wonderful Jesus, I pray that not one person shall see Catherine Kuhlman. Not a young person in this place today shall see Catherine Kuhlman. But I pray that not one young person shall cross the threshold of this place of worship, the same young person they were when they entered. The Holy Spirit shall move upon our waiting hearts. What I pray for them, I pray for myself. For no one in the whole world is as hungry for more than the one who is speaking this morning. If only these young people could know it. For just a few minutes as I bear my soul to them. I shall do something I have never done in my life before, never. And yet it's something I have to do. But through it all, may they know that the one who's speaking is crying out for more. Because there is so much. Every atom of my being is crying out for more, so much more. It's a simple prayer, but you know my heart. I never plan too much in advance, and I'll just be very frank with you. I usually take one day at a time. I take one service at a time. If I planned in advance, I would have had a nervous breakdown a long time ago. And let's just be practical about the thing. It is just like that. I knew I had the great service yesterday. And so we were praying about that. Last night, weary in body, I'll tell you, that was one of the shortest nights I ever spent. Something happened to Tulsa time. I don't know what it was. But when I awakened this morning, I was lying in the same position when I went to sleep last night. And I don't remember going to bed, you know. But when I awakened, I tell you the truth. I knew exactly what God wanted me to do. And I'm doing something I have never, never done in my life before. I tell you the truth. What I say to you, the world does not know. It is something that you don't talk about. It is something you don't tell the whole world. They wouldn't understand. God has a purpose. God has a reason for having asked me to do what I'm doing. I'm going to tell you what Catherine Kuhlman is really like. Every time somebody gets Dino off privately, one of the first things they'll ask is, what's Miss Kuhlman really like? Wherever they get my Maggie, I don't care where we are, anywhere in the nation, they'll get Maggie off and say, now Maggie, confidentially, what is Miss Kuhlman really like? When they get Dr. Metcalf off someplace privately, you know, probably inviting him for just a, a little luncheon or something, but they're really wanting to know just one thing. Dr. Metcalf, confidentially, what is Miss Kuhlman really like? Few people really know. My sister, my older sister, who's old enough to be my mother, 
said not more than three weeks ago. She looked me directly in the face and she said, you know, Catherine, I really still don't understand you. I really still don't understand you. And I often smile when those who are nearest to me will say, <laughs> that's all right, we understand you. I know Catherine. I know her better than anyone else in the whole world. And for just a very few minutes, I'm going to tell you what she's really like. You see what the world sees? It's just the glamour of it all. All of that 14,000 people really saw yesterday. All that the thousands of people really see of Catherine Kuhlman. She comes walking out on stage with a long white dress. And they see the smile. And some say she's a little too theatrical. Somebody in the Shrine Auditorium who didn't know who my older sister was and they were sitting directly behind her. They'd never been there before and they said, don't you think she's a little theatrical? And my older sister turned around and she said, I want you to know, I've known her since she was born and that's just Catherine. <laughs> and they see the glamour of everything and they think it's wonderful. And they think it must be a thrilling life. Oh, it must be a glorious life. All you have to do is to get on a long white dress. <laughs> All on earth that you have to do is to just stand up there and smile. All you have to do is to, is, to, is to just do it. I was on a talk show the other day, Dallas, Texas, and I was being interviewed and one of the questions was, Miss Kuhlman, what would you say to, to uh, a woman who uh, would aspire to be a woman preacher? You know what I said? I shocked the ones, it was a woman who was interviewing me, that she didn't get her breath for the rest of the telecast, I'll tell you that. I said, all right, I'll tell you what you do. Don't do it. If you've never been called, don't do it. If you've never had a real call from God, don't do it. But if you've had a real call from God, no matter what the cost is, do it. I made this illusion. It's more than a long white dress. It's more than just a smile on the face. It's more than coming out on the stage. I remember something that my papa said when I was very young. My papa was my idol. The most perfect man that ever lived. And I'll still face the whole world and say I had a papa. He was the most perfect man that ever lived. He was my idol. 
He was my love. If ever a girl worshipped her father, I worshipped my papa. I believed every word that he said. Papa couldn't be wrong. He couldn't. And I remember one day that Papa came and he said, baby, he called me baby and carried me when I was so tall, my legs dragged on the pain. And he was still lugging me. He said, baby, you know, you can have anything in the world that you want. I don't care what it is. You can have anything as long as you have these two good hands. Anything. Anything in the world that you want. You can be anything you want to be if you want it enough. I believed every word that Papa said. He said it. Papa couldn't lie. These hands, if I worked hard enough, I could get anything that I wanted. Papa worked hard. Papa wanted money. There was a day when Joe Coon was considered the richest man in Lafayette County. Ask anyone from Lafayette County, go to my little hometown, Concordia, Missouri. Ask anyone about Joe Coon. I'm not a celebrity in Concordia, Missouri, but my father was a man who is the man they remember as one day being the richest man in Lafayette County. And he had told me, baby, you can have anything. Anything. If you work hard enough with these hands. But Papa died. Without a copper cent. He had lost it all. Before he died. I have something I wouldn't part with for anything in the world. It's a dollar bill. It's a crisp dollar bill. I have it in a Bible. It's something very sacred to me. Something very sacred. I seldom pick it out and look at it, but there are times when I've taken it out and looked at it. That was the inheritance that I received when Papa's estate was settled. The man who was once considered the richest man in Lafayette County in Missouri, who said, baby, you can have anything if you work hard enough. And Papa worked, Papa worked morning, noon, and night, he worked. But when he died, he had lost it all and the only inheritance that he left to the one that he loved more than life itself his daughter, a man who one day would have given me his fortune, a man who would have given me anything, and my inheritance was my daughter. I've 
same people who have reached the very height of fame. It was their desire, it was their purpose, it was their longing, it was everything. How oh, fame! But they forgot how thick people really are. People are so thick. Human nature is so thick. When they thought of that Jesus, was going to set up an earthly kingdom. They followed him. They wanted to be a part of that earthly kingdom. They wanted a great position. These opportunists that hang on and you'll find them everywhere. And yet the same people, a very short time later, was standing at the foot of that cross, spitting upon him, ridiculing him, cheering him. Young people, you have much to learn. You have so much to learn. I would give anything in the world this morning if I could just give you a little of some of the things that I've gone through to help you that you won't have to go through some of these things. One thing, learn and learn it well. The fickleness of human nature. They'll love you one day. They'll kiss your hand one day. And they'll spit on you the next. There's only one upon whose love you can really rely, and that's his love. And so I considered it all. It wasn't something that just happened overnight, not really. Not really, I considered it all, the whole thing. Papa died, never having heard me preach a sermon, never once, Papa was killed instantly. It was almost as so though my heart of love was buried with him. But I saw something. I saw something. It's one of the greatest experiences of my life when that love was transformed into a greater love. And the love that one has for the master is not a human love. It's something so precious, so wonderful. And if I were to tell you the scripture that means more to me than any other scripture in the word of God, you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't be leaving. That's the reason I'm telling you some things the world has never known. I don't talk about it. Keep me as the apple of thine eye. Cover me with thy wings. David expressed it one day. Keep me. Nothing else really matters, not really, not really. Not really. Not really. 
You get to the place, you know, where you have eyes for just one. We have a mind for just one. Your purpose is fixed. You may not know what I'm talking about today. You may not know. But I pray to God, He'll give you an understanding. He'll give you an understanding. It's something that's spiritual. It's something that you can't generic. You can't manufacture. It's, it's, uh, I only pray you'll understand. You live for just one. You breathe for just one. Just one really matters really. You live to please Him. He has the apple of thine eye. Keep there are millions out there. But I have eyes for just one. Keep me. I really love just. I would lie to you if I told you I wasn't a lonely person. I would tell you an untruth if I told you that I wasn't lonely. Sometimes I feel like the loneliest person in the whole world. Surrounded by literally thousands and thousands, they press upon you, they crowd upon you, they'll tear your clothing. We love you, we love you. I know, and that's priceless, that's wonderful. For real friends, you can count them on one hand. You can take away the thumb that word friendship and friends is so empty. Is so Empty that word friend is so empty. I want you to know the real Catherine. The one who lives with just one purpose. Keep me. Regardless of the price, I'm human. Don't get the idea that I'm not human. I'm more human probably than anyone else in this place today. And besides that, I'm a woman. I was a woman before I ever became a preacher. I'm a woman. I'm human. I have emotions. 
I feel deeply. If I didn't feel deeply, how in the world could I feel for that one who is suffering in deep distress? He has given me a love that is so priceless. I guarded this carefully as one would guard a jewel. The most expensive jewel in the world. Think of the most expensive gem in the world. And it's guarded carefully. And the thing that I guard so carefully is this priceless jewel that I have, my love for the masses, my love for people, but it's a supernatural love. I tell you the God's truth that I have stood before someone for whom I'm to pray, knowing that I had no healing virtue, knowing that I had no power to heal that one. I'm there with an overpowering love for that one. Where literally I have prayed silently, if it costs me my life, please heal that one. Something I, I can't explain to you. It's something that's spiritual. It's something that's spiritual. Some of you young people may know what I'm talking about. Some may never know what I'm talking about. Some may never know. But it's something that he gives. It's a gift. Paul knew it. Paul understood it. As you read his writings, it was his priceless gift. Nothing else meant anything to him as much as this priceless something. for the master. Keep me. It's the apple of thine eye. I seek to please no man. I seek to please no woman. I want his smile. I want his favor. I want him to fold me close to his heart. I want him to look down. And when his service is all over with, and the crowd is leaving and I go back to an empty dressing room and I take off the long white dress and I take my feet out of the shoes. I think of just one thing. Did I please him? Did I do my best for him? My heavenly father. It costs something. Everything worthwhile costs something. You see, young people, is what you want most. Let me ask as I stand before you this Monday morning, what do you want more than anything else? What in life do you want more than anything else? What is it? I ask you a direct question. What is it? And you know, you know there isn't a young person in this place but what knows the answer. You know what your goal in life is. You know at your age, you may ask a youngster in the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, 
You may ask someone a sophomore in high school, a freshman. They may not know, but you're at the age, every one of you young people in this place are at the age, you know as an adult what you want most in life. You know. You know what your goal is. You know. And many of you be willing to pay the price to attain that goal. You may break hearts. You may ride over people. No matter what it costs, ethical or unethical, you're going to get it. You're determined you're going to get it. You don't care what it does to somebody else. You don't care. You're going to get it. You've made up your mind. You're determined. But there's nothing that demands a greater price than to be the apple of his eye and to know that underneath are his everlasting arms. It means that to will have to be surrendered at one. It's the hardest thing in the world. That's the hardest thing in the world. For remember, he has a will, a perfect will for you. Your will to his will. He'll never force you. Never. God the Father did not force his son. And Jesus came right up to the very shadow of the cross. Remember something. Jesus, the son of the living God. But remember when he was in the flesh, he was as much man as though he were not God. Know that. I do not believe for one minute that Jesus wanted to die. I don't believe it. I don't, I don't believe it. Of himself. And yet being as much man as though he were not God. He had a will separate and apart from the will of God the Father. And that will was not surrendered until he came right in the very shadow of the cross. Right to the very point of death. When he said, nevertheless, not to my will, but And had he not surrendered his will to the will of the Father, believe me of a truth, redemption's plan never would have been perfected. You and I would never have had life eternal. You and I would never have had the privilege of being heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. For me to tell you that it's easy to surrender, I wouldn't. I'd like to take your face in my hands and say to you, it isn't easy. What I'm saying to you isn't easy.
And I'd look you directly in the face and say it isn't easy. But I plead with you, I will get down on my hands and knees and plead with you. Surrender that will of yours. Surrender it. You may aspire to great things and say, look what I can be. Look at my potentialities. I can be the world's greatest. The crowd will applaud. That's so temporary. all so empty when you realize how fickle people are, how short life is. The price is too great, really. I've weighed it all. And I made my choice. And my choice By choice, I have chosen His will, and I pray. The surrender of the physical body, I'm talking about something, I'm talking about something that's real, I'm talking about something. I have chosen. It's my choice. I have chosen to surrender my body as a living sacrifice. Praying it shall be acceptable unto him. A living sacrifice. Filled with the Holy Spirit, being led of the Holy Ghost, it's my choice. I wasn't very old. I'm not quite sure how old. Less than 10 years of age. <coughs> At our house, Monday morning, Mama always washed. Always. You've come from a home like that, too. Tuesday was ironing day, no matter what happened. You've come from a home like that, too. We had a laundry stove in the basement. And how often I've seen my mother. She's always boiled the white sheets and the pillowcases. One Monday morning, she had the boiler on the laundry stove in the basement. When a telephone call came and a relative was very ill, and they sent for Mama and said, would you please come quickly? And Mama said to me, now, Catherine, I'll be back. Don't touch anything. It was the wrong thing to say. But I'll be back just as quickly as I can. And after Mama was gone, I thought, I'll surprise her. I'll do the 
the washing. I'll do the whole thing. I'll do everything. And when she comes back, she'll be tired. She'll be so surprised. She'll be so surprised. And I went down the basement. The boiler was full of water with the soap chips in it. I put the sheets in it. I got them out. I put the pillow slips in it. I boiled them, and when they were through, I boiled everything in sight. I boiled the woolens. I boiled the colored clothes. I boiled them all. And then I remember my excitement when it was all over. With my excitement was so great, I thought, "Won't she be surprised?" <laughs> I could never tell you the thrill on the inside. I could never, I could never begin to tell you how I felt. I could never tell you. We always hung our clothes out on the clothesline, you know. And the box of that clothesline they were a little too high for me, and I went in the kitchen, got the kitchen chair. And and、uh, would stand on the kitchen chair to pin some of the. I thought some of them were looking a little strange, and I I I pinned them on. And then when they were all dry, I got the clothes basket out. You'll never know how you, to this day what I'm talking about you. I I I can still feel the excitement, the excitement from the inside of me. Mama would be so happy. Mama would be so thrilled. I did the washing. When she'd come home, she'd find it all done. Four o'clock came. Five o'clock came. Mama didn't come home. It was late, and I didn't go to bed. I waited. I had to see her face when she saw what I had done. <laughs> And I had all the clothes; they were all dry. Had them all in the wash basket. I had them in the kitchen, so the first thing she would see when she'd come home was surprise, surprise. I shall never forget. She'd been in the hospital all that day, so weary, weary. Probably nothing to eat. And she came to that kitchen door. I'll never forget the look on her face. I'll never. She walked in, and she looked at that clothes basket, and she saw the expensive things that I had ruined. There was a little chalet coat. It was expensive. It was especially made from Kansas City. I had boiled it. It had shrunk to nothing. Some of her best things. I'll never forget her face. She stood there for just a moment, looked at those things, and then she looked up at me, and she saw my face. I think those are the hardest words that my mother ever had to utter when she said, "You did a good job." <laughs> I've often wondered what I'm going to say. 
When I see Jesus for the very first time, no one in the whole world knows how much I love him. No one. No one knows. I would live on bread and water and work just as hard as I'm working today. If I didn't get a copper cent, if I didn't get a penny, if I had to hitchhike instead of ride, he knows my heart. I started out in Idaho on five cent rolls and sleeping in a turkey house. I'll go back again to the turkey house. I'll go back again to just enough sustenance to keep my body going. And I'll work just as hard. But my life, it hasn't been for six months, or a year, or five years, or ten years. Yet never having seen him, and yet loving him enough to have given my life to him. I often wondered if in that moment, when I see him for the very first time and I look upon his face and his Jesus it is Jesus and there he stands Jesus I know exactly I know exactly. I know. I won't say I love you. He knows that. He knows that. If he doesn't know it now, he never will. I won't have to wait till then to tell him. For love is something you do. You keep doing. But when I see him, I'll say just two words. I tried. I tried. In many things I've been so wrong. I've boiled some things when they should not have been boiled. I've used too harsh a detergent and some things where I should not have. I've spoken words when I should have kept my mouth shut. made decisions when if only I had waited. I acted in haste when there should have been patience. Standing before you in this chapel this morning, if only I knew right now if only I could know what he really had in for me in many instances. But I ruined the washing. Not intentionally. So help me God, if he knows my heart. 
I didn't do it intentionally. I wouldn't have grieved him. I wouldn't have gone contrary to his will for a title deed to the whole world. I did it out of ignorance. I did it because I was stupid. I did it because I didn't wait for his leading. I did it sometimes because I listened to other voices instead of his voice. But there was never a time when I didn't want more than anything else for him to keep me as the apple of his eye. And as long as I know that underneath all those everlasting laws, I can face anything. I can face all the devils of hell. I can face the whole world. And it never faces me. Never. Never. Why can I stand with my shoulders squared? Why can I speak with boldness? Where do I get my courage? From whom do I get my spiritual strength? From the one whom I love more than life itself. One of these days, I will have preached my last sermon. One of these days, I will have prayed for the last person who comes into a miracle service. One of these days, my old heart will take its last beat. And the world will call me a fool for having given my life for one whom I have not seen. But in that day, in spite of my failures, in spite of my mistakes, I will stand before him. Blameless. Blameless. He shall present me before the Father. Blameless. Do you know what that means? Blameless, not because of my righteousness. Not to because of anything that I have done. But I'll stand blameless through the perfection and the righteousness of his only begotten Son, my Lord and my Savior. he died for. Eyes closed. Every eye closed. <coughs> I've told you what Catherine Kuhlman is really like. Misunderstood by thousands. 
misunderstood? But it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter at all. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The only thing that's real that really matters is my relationship with him. <clears throat> I know what I want most. I have but one life. That's all. And it passes very quickly. Young people, it passes very quickly. You're young today. Many of you in your teens. And you feel there's a whole world out there. And you feel it is forever. You feel it's forever, but I tell you, it passes very quickly. The hours pass quickly. The days pass quickly. The months pass quickly. The years pass quickly. So quickly until one day you're startled and you'll say, where have the years gone? Where? God. What has happened to those years? And you give, give anything in the world if you could turn the clock back, but you can't. And there's just you. Just you. Your life. Your life. You've been a part of living. What do you want most? Only you can make that choice. Only you. Only you, the real you. Papa wanted money. Once he had it. But all that he could leave his daughter when he was killed. A child he loved more than life itself was a one dollar bill. There are those who played to the crowd. And they heard the applause. And a woman in the newspaper this morning at the very height of her writing career, at the very peak of it all, at the age of 53, Died of cancer. What do you want most? What do you? What do you? I ask you, he asks you. Maybe you haven't thought of it seriously. You've been so determined to get it. You've been so determined to get it. But you haven't really cared or thought too much about it. But one of these days, 
When it's all over with, can you stand in his presence, knowing that you've been kept with the apple of his eye? That you've been covered with his wings, oh beloved, to be in a position where you're completely hidden under his wings is so secure. You feel so secure. There's such security. I can't tell you what that feeling is. You become a very secure person. There can be no insecurity. I tell you the God's truth. There can be no insecurity. And this is a very insecure generation. There never was a generation that was so insecure. And some of you young people are so insecure. And some of you are not so young. You really face reality. There's such insecurity there. Maybe you'll not be able to admit it yourself, but it, there's such insecurity there. That's the reason you have to lean so heavily on others. But oh, the only person who is a really secure person is the one who knows that underneath are his everlasting arms and you're covered with his wings hide me under the shadow of thy wings the evil one cannot touch me the waters shall not overflow Covered with thy wing, I'm protected. I'm not afraid. I'm no longer an insecure person. He's my God. He's my everything. I made the choice. I made my choice. I wish this morning I'd give anything in the world this morning. I could make the same choice for each of you. I'd give anything. I wish I could take you by the hand and present you before the Father and say to him, I've made the choice for this one. I have made the choice. I choose that this life shall be wholly used for you at any cost, at any price. Nothing from here on out will matter more than just to be the apple of thine eye. With your smile, dead to self. Two wheels having become as one. But I can't go any further with you than I've gone in bearing my own soul. I've never done this before, never. But in so doing, I can just help one of you young people, just one of you. The choice that you make can shake the world for God. If I can have just one of you make the same choice that I made, just one of you, and that can be the most unlikely person in this place. 
just one of you. If what I have said and bury my soul will help you to make that choice, you may be the one who will literally shake the world for God. No urging. It's something you're not compelled to do. It's something that no one can influence you to do. No amount of talking. No amount of argument. No scolding. No doctrine. It isn't much learning. Perhaps not even the word. And it's something even the master won't force you to do. He hasn't forced me to do one thing. It's my choice. And you make the choice. If you'll make that choice, little do you know what he'll do for you. I want you to come and stand right here, not more than five minutes. And then you'll be ready to go back to your class again. And I'll pray for you. Come on. I make that choice, Catherine Coogan. I make that choice. I make that choice, Catherine Coogan. I will make that choice. Coming down here in this hour with all of heaven bending low, little do you know, walking down these steps, little do you know, little do you know. God's will for you, little do you know. From among you, there will be those who shake the nations for God. And I believe that, I believe that, I believe that. I believe that. You're in a position, in the position. Well, he's training you for that very thing. That's why you're here. But it takes more than just the training. It takes more than just the mental training. It takes a consecration. You've got to make the choice. Wonderful Jesus is the power of the Holy Ghost are from among oh and the power of the Holy Ghost and the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon it. Standing right here, standing right here in this chapel this morning, standing right here. Little do these young people know the potentialities. Little do they know the perfect will of God. Little do they know. It's not an hour for compromise. It's not. It's not an hour to live for self. It's not an hour for selfish motive. It's not an hour. It's not an hour. It's not an hour for that. It's a day to be used as a master. It's an hour to be used of the master. It's an hour, that's an hour to be used of him. It's an hour, please, with the Holy Spirit upon you. It's all over this place. It's all over this auditorium and they're still coming down. 
and they're still coming down. So
I promise you something. I give you the word of prophecy from out of this group this morning. There will be young people who will shake the nations for God. There are young people standing just now in his holy presence who will literally shake the nations for God. I promise you, I have called you forth out of the I worship. I worship you. I worship you. Is left with you. He'll take, he'll use what you yield unto him. You make the choice. President Roberts, where are you? I pray that not one of these students shall leave this place this Monday morning. Not one shall leave this place the same person they were when they entered. May there be the glory and the blessing upon you. My Lord and my God, he is one who's been obedient to you. He knows better than anyone in this chapel this morning what we were talking about. He knows. But it's still just the beginning for him. It's still only the beginning for us. For all of us taken present. Amen. 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 Somewhere, somehow, the Holy Spirit is going to deal with you and you'll know it. That's what she's been saying, that you're going to make a choice. Whether you want to make it or not, you'll, you'll make it one way or the other. And today, Monday, is the day. Today is the day of salvation, is what she's been saying. Not tomorrow, and not the day after, but today. She's saying now, she's saying it now in the Spirit. Now. It doesn't take you forever to make the decision, God, I submit my will to you. To you, God. I, I may stumble and make mistakes and all that now. But I'm going to get up if I stumble. Because I've submitted my will. My will is yours, God. If I... If I'm in a... If I'm a religion major, I'm going to submit my will. If I'm an athlete, I'm going to submit my will to God. If I'm a, in the music department, I'm going to submit my will to God. If I'm a coach or a teacher or a president or a dean, I'm going to submit my will to God. And I'm going to do it today, somewhere, somehow on this campus, all over it, anywhere on it. That's what she's saying of the Spirit. Today is the day. Submit my will, mine, to God. Ms. Kuhlman, is that what you've been saying in the Spirit? It's exactly. Now. Tomorrow may be too late. Now. Now. This moment. This, this moment. very moment. Can it be done as they 
walk or as they walk on the campus or sit in a classroom or go to a dorm room or, or at the dining table or what? And after you have done it, I came to that moment of decision. And when I reached that decision, it was definite. The most definite thing that I have ever done in my life. And I want you to know something. I have never turned back once. I have never for one minute turned back. And don't go. Then go in the name of the Lord. Go to your classes. Somehow, some way today, make that decision. I submit my will to God.